everybody. Uh, thanks for coming. It's my pleasure to introduce Stuart to Roger tonight. Uh, Stuart is a, a, the artistic director of the, I, I just Googled him. I've never heard of the guy before. Uh, and I hope this is the right Stuart or Roger. Uh, like that safe search off, you, you never know. Yeah. Um, Stuart Rodner is the artistic director of the Atlanta Contemporary Art Center. He has held positions as visual arts curator at the Portland Institute for Contemporary Art in Portland, Oregon. He was the director of the Bucknell University Art Gallery in Lewisburg, Pennsylvania, and was co-owner of the Rodner Romley Gallery in New York. He founded and co-directed the Affair at the Jupiter Hotel, an annual art fair in Portland. Uh, Stewart has contributed to art journals and magazines, including Art Issues, Art Lives, Art of Paper, Bomb, Days of Confuse, Sculpture, and Surface. He has served as an advisor at, in an advisory capacity to organizations including Art Adia, the Fund for Art and Dialogue, Creative Capital, the Haley Ford Family Foundation, and the McDowell Family. He received his BFA from Cooper Union in New York, New York, and he has an MFA from the Mason Grove School of the Arts at Rutgers. So please join me in welcoming Mr. Roger. Thank you. So the first thing that you um, understand with that introduction is that people in the arts move around. Right? You'll hear things like, so-and-so is currently the whatever at wherever. So just the three or four things that Owen mentioned tell you about a trajectory that I had from starting out as an artist in New York, owning a gallery there, moving to a small town in central Pennsylvania, running a university gallery there, moving to Portland, Oregon, and doing some things there, and now moving to Atlanta, and I've been there for seven years. I've moved always for jobs, and I never imagined that I would be living in any of the, I would have lived in any of those cities that were mentioned. The topic of the discussion, and I'm very happy to be here, and want to thank uh, Joel and and Bowen and maybe others who are responsible for bringing me here. Um, the thing that probably doesn't come up on Google is this book, which I think some of you know a little bit about. And it's pretty much what the topic of the talk is going to be about today. About a year or so ago, I wrote this book. Uh, I say wrote. It was as much writing as compiling. Uh, I think of it in a sense as curating a book, if you could imagine that, how that might work. Um, and the book is called The Art Life on Creativity and Career. And many of you may have taken or sat in on or will things that are loosely called professional practice classes, right? Things that talk to you about how to be an artist. Um, the thing that seemed interesting to me was, and there are some wonderful books uh, out available on that topic, things that tell you about how to go cultivate your package, your resume, or what portfolio, what you might send to people, how to talk about what you do, all the sort of mechanics of doing, like how to go be a professional. And to my mind, uh, having started as an artist, having evolved into writing about art, teaching about art, organizing shows of various kinds, there's not enough discussion about why anybody wants to be an artist in the first place and how you actually sustain that over a lifetime. Because I think for the most part, people, when they want to become an artist, they have a loose idea of how they might go and become successful, but they may not have a very clear idea of how long that's gonna take and what kind of commitment that requires of you and how much of that is out of your control. And so that's some of the stuff we're gonna talk about a little bit today. So this is the cover of the book. This is our gallery space in Atlanta at the Contemporary Art Center. This is an artist, Jenny C. Jones, uh, looking at what was her first wall mural uh, painted on the wall of the gallery, uh, a total ephemeral thing, which would be painted over when the show was over. Um, and then I, I, I shot the photograph, and I sort of like it because it reminds me of a very famous photograph of Mark Rothko sitting in an Adirondack chair looking at if you know Rothko's work, a picture that might seem very much like that. So this book that I wrote, and the book really is the result of many years of thinking about how to talk about 
creativity and why people do what they do and what motivates them. This whole book started from two point, two, really two statements. This is the first one. You give yourself a creative life. And what I mean by that is you're pretty much responsible, so the other things which are listed here. Where do you work? What do you work with? How many things do you make? Okay. Um, what's, what's your name? Laura. Laura? Okay. If you want to make watercolors, Laura, at your kitchen table on Wednesday nights in your pajamas, nobody really is going to tell you that you shouldn't do that. You know, if you want to make welded sculptures in your backyard, based on mythological themes, because that's what totally gets you up in the morning, and that's where your energy is, and that's what you're thinking about all damn day, you get to decide that that's what you want to do, right? What you're reading, what you're motivated by, what you care about, who your role models are, what might be inspiring to you. Come on and sit down, don't worry about it. Um, all of these things are pretty much things which you dictate the terms of. Right? Nobody's going to tell you you shouldn't be interested in making steel boxes of a certain size and putting them in the landscape. That's like pretty much what you get to decide. This is a photograph, uh, a very famous photograph, <laughs> uh, whose title is very long and uh, involved the great artist. Julian Waring, sir. Julian Waring. I have a special guest who's going to remember everything I forget. <coughs> Julian Waring is a British artist, uh, quite well known, emerged in the mostly 19, uh, early 90s. Uh, and this is a very famous photo in a series of images of people that she found on the street where she handed them blank cards and asked them to write statements about what they were thinking. Um, I believe that this is totally correct. I do not appear here in front of you without having known some of the people that invited me, having met them several years ago, having talked with them in Atlanta. All of these things are connected. How we all get to be wherever we're going to be is connected through a series of people, ideas, intentions. Um, this is, for people who know this book, um, this is a series of uh, this is basically a, a journal that I keep. I paste in various things, images, texts. Um, and they're things that inspire me, things that I find are interesting in one way or another. Um, they involve things like chefs and writers. That's Jonathan Franzen, the novelist. Who I think they're going to use the little this one Yes, there's Jonathan Franzen. Um, and I love this little text. Jonathan Franzen, at the time that this picture appeared, wherever I cut it out of, um, is a very well-known and successful novelist. And I do really believe in what he's saying here, that writing is always a struggle, that in many times in the process, you're working and writing for 20, 25 years, and that somehow you can't imagine how you could write anything that didn't suck. It's even the most confident people are often filled with doubt. Um, but again, Franzen is writing about what he's interested in. Tom Colicchio, the uh, chef, People know him from, if you watch, you know, TV Food Network or any of those competitive shows. Um, you know, he decided to make his mark with steakhouses and very traditional kinds of cooking with a particular flair. The chapters of this book go through <coughs> the various things that I think fall into these internal and external categories. The things that you give yourself might be what motivates you, what influences you, advice that various people might have given you, teachers, friends, parents, the subject matter that you might be interested in. Right? We show at the Art Center, and I've shown throughout my entire career, uh, a range of art, abstract painting, political art, art about the body, art about sexuality, art about identity, uh, art that involves a legacy of conceptual practices that are barely objects at all, but ideas that find interesting forms and almost can't be shown in traditional formats. Uh, performance, any number of them, whatever you want to work in, whatever medium and with whatever subjects, right? Um, you're not interrupting me if you want to find a seat, but you're totally cool there if you want to do it. <clears throat> what your process is, 
you know, does something take, you know, how do you work? Do you work from photographs? Do you work from notes? Do you make sketches? Like, what do you do? You know, those are all the things that you pretty much define. What do you read? What do you write? What's your sense? And now we're, now we're slowly moving into some more things which go from you to outside of you. Pretty much from eight on will now be about, this is the external piece. This is the non you deciding. This is about other people and what they give you, okay? I can't just show up here and start talking. I need to be invited. I don't live here, right? <laughs> this career that Owen read about from the Google, as my father called it, um, like that history, whatever the hell I've done, like is what's getting me to be invited to do talks like this. But it's about me and others, and those others give me the career that I have. I can do a certain amount of it myself, but your teachers and their job here, their careers, where they show, if they get written about, if they get grants, right? All of these things are now dictated by other people. And so you're always, as an artist, negotiating between the things that you have control over and the things you need other people for. So, once you say you would like to put your work or whatever you do, your writing, your theater, your performance, your cooking, whatever, in the world, you're opening up a relationship that you're gonna have with other people. And that may be everything from totally frustrating to joyous and everything in between. <clears throat> because in the arts, that's now going to deal with you wanting things and you not getting them. And you either understanding why you didn't get them or being confused about what happened. You thought you were perfect for that, right? Or weird things that happen when people you don't know come to look at what you make and don't understand it. You put all these ideas into the thing you made. You were so earnest. You really wanted this to work out well and nobody got it. Well, that happens. Uh, are you good at, a lot of people become artists because they like being alone. You know, they like the feel of stuff oozing through their fingers in a room by themselves. You, that, that is not the same skill. See, you're laughing because you know what I'm talking about. That's not the same skill as whether you're good at talking to people or whether you like talking to people or whether you will put on a nice outfit and go to an opening and try to do something that benefits you. That's not the same skill. Some people hate that. Some people will never be good at it. That's okay. There are people who are not good at it who have unbelievable careers. It is just that that's all the external stuff. How do you get your work out? How do you deal with being invited to show? What will you do with the opportunity when you get one? How will you be in dialogue with other people who will be the curator, the dealer, the collector? Um, what happens if you are lucky enough to get a review and it isn't good? How do you handle that? You know, do you have the spine and the stamina to like handle that and know that, okay, that's somebody's opinion and it's in print and your mother and your friends and everybody's gonna read it and it's gonna piss you off. Well, what do you do with that? Sales of your work, pressures on you, no sales of your work. All of this stuff is the external conditions that are going to operate <clears throat> with you, against you, around you. Um, and everybody does this stuff differently. Everybody handles it differently. Everybody has different skill sets. So I'm just sort of running through the challenges and some of the things in the book. Um, motivation, this is a, a, an artist named Daniel Boschkov. What you see Daniel doing in a field in Maine is jumping up and down on a wooden plank to create, in a sense, a crop circle. Everybody knows what a crop circle is, right? Well, this crop circle was in a, in a uh, field in Maine. The crop circle was in the shape of the talk show host, Larry King. <laughs> the project was called, um, 
how to learn. Learning to fly. Learning to fly over very, very large. See, I told you he was going to be essential. <laughs> I knew that I needed to bring him. Um, this is Craig Drennan, by the way. He is an extremely interesting artist who's in Atlanta and teaches at Georgia State University. Um, uh, how to fly over, how to learn, you know, how to fly over a very large Larry involved Daniel learning about the various uh, uh, grasses and uh, plants and herbs and things that grew in this field, learning how to scale up and create this very old-fashioned way of making a crop shape, making the crop shape, and then learning how to fly a small plane in order to see the crop shape that he had made and in order to document it. Pretty interesting. This guy's work is all about, quite often, learning to do things that he previously didn't know how to do. Learning new skill sets, learning new tasks, using situations. Uh, Istanbul uh, as a city, uh, street culture, various situations he gets invited into. Some rural, some urban, some historical, some brand new. So here's Daniel learning how to do this project. Here are some of the entries in the motivation section of this book. And you'll see very quickly that the range of people that I put in this book are very well-known novelists and journalists, art gallery dealers. Arnold Lyncher is the uh, director of Case Gallery in New York. Andy Moon Wilson is an artist in our uh, community in Atlanta. So you have well-known people, less-known people. Um, I know many artists who feel to some degree what Joan Didion is saying here. I, I make work in order to understand what I care about. Um, I want to know how I interact with the world. Um, I think it's really interesting for a powerful art dealer to say that he really wants to be an artist. That, in my mind, tells you something about the motivation of his gallery, what he hopes to be achieving there. You know, you can judge whether he's achieving that, but it's interesting to say, as an art dealer, part of his motivation is to get as close as he can to being an artist. I find that fascinating. Um, this is a uh, curious thought, but we have in the 19th century, 20th century, maybe the 21st, I'm not sure what our mandate is now, but in the 20th century, certainly many artists thought that their job was to slap people in the head and shake them up and make them anxious. And so Andy is part of a long tradition of people who want to make people kind of upset. I'm not sure that his work does that, but it's interesting that he says that he wants to do that. Influence. Anybody know the reference of this work? This is Fahamu Piku making a work called Rock Well. That's a hint. Anybody? People know the source for this? Anybody? Norman Rockwell on what? A self-portrait. A self-portrait that appeared where? Saturday evening. Excellent. OK, so here's Fahamu Piku uh, making a, I think, extremely lively. <coughs> this is really tough to do. If you're going to use something that's really well known in this kind of way, and try to make it yours and do it in a spirited, thoughtful way. Um, this certainly is a very accomplished in terms of rendering kind of capacity painting, but it's also, you know, he's got a bottle of booze on the table, he's got his patron saints up here, Muhammad Ali, Jean Michel Basquiat, Andy Warhol. Um, He's, he's talking about his own relationship to a history of drawing and painting and populist drawing and painting, right? Illustration, appearing on magazines. It might not surprise you that this artist became very well known for making pictures of himself as if they were on the cover of various magazines, mostly art magazines. So Portrait of Fahamu on the cover of Vibe, Art Forum, Flash Art, Cigar Aficionado, Right? In a sense, if nobody's putting him on the cover of magazines, he's going to put himself on the cover of magazines. Anybody know the singer Tom Waits? Okay, Look at the range of people that Tom Waits says have influenced him. Writers, other music. 
musicians, actors, film directors, musicians of various stripes and histories. I think one of the most interesting things you can ask an artist or any creative people is this question. Who, who's influenced you? Why? What are you, whose work has had something to do with how you think, what you care about? That's the artist Tony Tassett, who lives in Chicago. Anybody want to take a wild stab at who he feels influenced by by this photograph? Anybody? Neil Young. I'm sorry? Neil Young. Neil Young? Good. It's from a series of photographs of Tony becoming his heroes. There's a very interesting photograph of him with an undersized shovel in the desert as he becomes one of his other art heroes, Robert Smithson, whose work obviously involved working in the landscape. Um, there's a performance artist, Hanya Liftig, who used to be an Atlanta-based artist, now lives in New York. find it really interesting when you ask Anya, like who she's been interested in, and she says Mary Richards from the Mary Tyler Moore Show. So these are, do not always have to be like sober, non-amusing, canonical, like expected answers. You're, you're influenced by who you're influenced by. And when you get to see, if you get to see work by Anya Lifted, you will understand that her interest in people like Peter Sellers, in terms of body control, absurdity, the excessive funny behavior, being a fool, being out of control, uh, makes perfect sense. <coughs> Now you're looking at a series of other images. I'm showing art so that anybody can see here. This is a work by the artist Susan Silton from Los Angeles. These are a series of postcards um, that are printed and mailed out to various people. So you get these in the mail, several of them over the course of months. And the, in and the texts are texts which were translated into English from texts that were dropped in the Middle East on countries that we were at war with before we bombed them. So the texts are taken from the military. Um, they're meant to be dropped on a citizenry who reads it and gets scared to death. And it's a campaign that the United States does in various times. She's taken that language, translated it, put them onto very nice, palatable, colorful things, and sent them out to people. So you get them in the mail. Um, David Smith, the American sculptor, um, asks this interesting question, which is, you know, who are you indebted to? If these people have influenced you or motivated you, what do you owe them, if anything? <coughs> this is a project that we did in Atlanta uh, where I asked several artists to respond to historical artworks. This is a David Smith drawing, uh, very typical of his drawings and works on paper made with spray paint and various objects being placed on the paper. This is his daughter, Rebecca Smith, who's a sculptor in New York. She has been asked a million times, because her father is a very important American sculptor, and just think about that, like your father is a major American sculptor, and now you're trying to be a sculptor. And she manages with her husband, her father's estate. So every day, this woman's reality is about some kind of connection to her father. And so for years, she avoided any possible way of engaging her artwork with the legacy of her father. She has chosen, interestingly enough, her father's a well-known metal field sculptor. Uh, she has chosen to work primarily in very ephemeral material. Paper, ribbon, things pinned to the wall. I mean, almost the opposite strategy of her father making things that will last forever. She works making things that barely will last ever. I asked her, and I knew full well what I was doing when I asked her and the challenge of this, of whether or not she would be willing to come to Atlanta to be part of an exhibition where I would provide her with a work of her father's that she could respond to. And what she wound up making was a 40-foot wall work called Birthday, which was in response to this work that I borrowed from a collector in Atlanta. 
it the first time that she ever engaged directly in her father's legacy. And she was quite emotional about it and quite uh, engaged, really, in what it meant for her to remember her upbringing, what her father would, be, would do on her birthdays, which involved various kinds of ornate decoration, which had something to do with what she actually made in the gallery. Um, I, I found it an absolute sort of joy, wonder, moment of great pleasure that she was willing to come and play with us in this way. Um, advice? We'll move past there. There's some dirty words there. You know, dirty. Um, uh, I think my friend, the artist in, in LA, Amanda Rosso, I think this is one of the great reminders for all of us. It's not enough just to do good and sort of survive. It's, you know, just to get through it, just to feel like you're like kind of, I did it, what do you want from me? But you want to have a career? You better be better than just good. As a curator, as a person who runs an art center, I will tell you that there are a lot, I mean a lot, and you may be many of them, there are a lot of just plain good artists. Good, they're good. It's like, there are a bunch of good restaurants. I'm sure we could walk a mile from here and find like a good restaurant. If you had to eat something to stay alive, you could eat there. But you don't really go back there often. You wouldn't really recommend it to anybody else. That's the difference between <coughs> good, serious, making stuff, caring about it, artist, and artist who also cares, also makes good things, but also puts some extra something in the mix. Sometimes it's noble, sometimes it's some other magic, you're not quite sure what it is. Ambition, scale, materiality, time, all those things can make art go from kind of good to kind of great. This is a work by Bill Albertini, who almost uniformly works with the, the digital. He, well, he's a sculptor, trained at Yale, stopped making actual objects almost a decade or so ago, and now makes virtual objects. This is a work that he made for that same show that uh, Rebecca Smith was in. It's based on a pencil drawing by Giorgio Morandi, you know, an artist very well known for what? He made works about bottles, arrangements of bottles for almost his entire life. This is a work by Bill, where Bill literally built a, in the computer, with a design program, and then lit, obviously, and then printed out as a giant wall work, this still life arrangement that was based only on the most flimsy of drawings. Um, along the same lines as the earlier list by Tom Waits, here's a list of subjects that Johnny Cash, over the entirety of his life, feels like most of his songs are about. I think that pretty much covers most of Chinese songs. <laughs> That's a pretty good list, particularly my damnation. Now, I would tell you, how many people in the room have ever had to write an artist statement? Okay. This is an artist statement, I think. It's not typical. But it's a pretty damn good order statement if you're going to say, what do I care about? So part of the challenge, part of the reason I tried to write this book, and when I talk to artists about what they're doing, when I talk to colleagues, when I try to think about what I'm doing, I'm trying to come up with ways of doing very basic things that many of us often get asked to do with a slight twist, with a slight wrinkle. How do you make it more interesting? Okay? If you were applying to grad school and you sent this in, Believe me, somebody on a committee looking at your work would go, this is not like everybody else's. And that might just be enough to get you plucked out of a group of 40 or 50 people. That becomes part of your job. Being yourself and being interesting and trying to keep open how to present yourself in a kind of interesting way. Process is a very wide open chapter. It's very much about things happening in a variety of ways. This is a project, I love this project. This is a woman named Deb Marshall hitting what looks like, and it is, a metal box. This uh, metal box is a chair 
waiting to become a chair. It's made by the Dutch design company Droog Design. It's called Do Hit Chair. You buy this work, it comes in a container, you take it out, it's a very thin milled aluminum box. It comes with a sledgehammer. <laughs> your challenge is to hit the metal box into a form which is your idea of a chair. When you've finished, you put the hammer down and you sit in the chair that you've made. It totally makes the design of the work audience purchaser centric. quote from Dia Selman's talking about process, the idea that sometimes, you know, this is Dia who's quite well known for the work she's done, drawings extremely precise and rendered, uh, almost intensely, drawings of galaxies, drawings of oceans and desert, I don't know if you may know this work. Um, she's talking basically about how much of this work came out of just working with pencil. Sometimes it's like the medium itself is giving you some input, some idea. You just love that black pencil. You just love that erasure. You just love that ink that does some magical thing when you put it on film. You know, sometimes it's the material. This is the Canadian sculptor Francois Morelli, who's a sculptor, performance artist, uh, makes uh, countless drawings in various scales and forms. This is a sculpture of his. It's, a, it's made out of uh, belts of various kinds that he buys at thrift stores or has from his family. He's woven this belt into a head, which he's called belt head, which literally hangs as a sculpture from other belt belts. And it's, it's sort of a fetish mask, almost like a kind of, uh, many people who know Nancy Grossman, the sculptor who precedes this artist. Uh, very, very intense, almost S&M kind of uh, mask. And at some point or another, Francois started to use the, draw, the, the belt head by putting a pen in the mouth of the head, putting his hand up into the head, and imagining this figure almost as if it's another person making the drawing. And the drawings being made are drawings of other belt heads. So in a sense, it's a kind of self-replicating object. This is a sculptor, Matt Bryans, who uh, we did a project with when I first got to Atlanta. He makes drawings with newspaper and erasure. Uh, he also makes these very small little, almost stalactite or stalagmite. Uh, uh, he's from Britain, so I think the connection to things like Stonehenge and ancient piles and things that come out of uh, early, early uh, civilization, the first ideas of stacking and making something purposeful. These are all little tiny arrangements of burnt aluminum, burnt and crushed aluminum. And they sit exactly the way they sit like this on the floor. They seem very, and are very precarious, very delicate, very made out of nothing, but have a really interesting little presence. Morton Feldman. Morton Feldman is a great minimalist composer in the 50s and 60s and into the 70s. Um, artists who know that working is sometimes you're working, sometimes you're thinking about working. Sometimes you're taking a shower. Sometimes you're doodling. Sometimes you're taking your dog for a walk. <clears throat> you're, in one way or another, always working. And as Feldman says, and I think I, I, I agree, sometimes it's just about paying attention, listening, being quiet. Sometimes it's about working like a lunatic. Sometimes it's about working for five minutes, if those five minutes are fruitful. This is Amanda Ross Ho, uh, the artist I mentioned earlier. We quoted her, not just good enough to be good, uh, be better than good, or not just survive, be good. This is Amanda making a, one of the works on campus, bless you, uh, out in our courtyard at the Contemporary Art Center. This is a work called Boundary Issues by two architects. Uh, these architects are currently doing a renovation at our art center this summer. This was them responding to a photograph by the artist Gordon Matta Clark from 19, early 1970s. <clears throat> a photograph 
called Bingo. There's a four frame from a film. The, you know, for people who know Matt Clark, the dismantling of a house in New Jersey. <clears throat> and so what they proposed to us was that they wanted to do a gesture in the gallery, <clears throat> where they would respond to the idea of the Gordon Matt Clark, but they would also respond to our space, and there were several things about our space that they hated, <coughs> that they were hoping to rectify <clears throat> with this one work. The things that they hated include there used to be a wall that covered this area that pretty much ran under this metal truss. And effectively, as you can see, the corner of this room is it comes to a corner. It's not a straight square. It just comes to an oblique angle. Um, they found that very interesting as architects. Your building is a triangle, and nobody knows it because this wall is preventing people from seeing that. The other thing they realized was that there were many windows, this is an old auto repair factory, uh, there were many windows that uh, if you actually could punch a hole in the window, this window didn't exist, you could see that the gallery was literally under street level, right? This grade of dirt is showing you that <coughs> the gallery is subterranean. When you're in the gallery, you have no idea that that's true. The other thing they hated was the fact that when you're in the gallery in the art center, period for that matter, you really had no sense of where you were in the city. You had no easy sight lines. You couldn't really tell, am I facing north? Or, like, where the hell am I? Their project was, their proposal was, this is where my work gets really fun. Uh, we'd like to take this wall down and have you move all of the crap that you store back there, pedestals, archival materials, folders, <coughs> floor to ceiling filing cabinets. We don't care where you put it, but we just want you to move it somewhere. Then we want to trace the grade of the interior from the exterior. So if you literally walked around our building, what you would find is that the exterior grade went along that side with dirt up to the street and came around. So they said, we want to trace that from the outside on the inside, and then literally with a sawzall, cut through the entire sheetrock plywood electrical system and remove it all. Just take it all down so that you literally have that line of the exterior on the interior, which will now show you that you're below ground, right? Then we want to put a giant eight-foot picture window in the gallery and clean all of this up. And when we clean all of it up, the inside will meet the outside. You'll see through the gallery window where you are in the city, because there's like Coke building and some other well-known stuff back there. And you'll have a direct sight line from the lobby entrance somewhere over here to the corner of the building. So we want to fix these three things in one gesture. And we'll do this in about two weeks, and it's going to cost us. And I was like, is there a plan B? <laughs> because that's like a crazy amount of work to do. That's also like, I don't even know if I'm allowed to punch a hole in the building. I, I mean, I have to call some people. I have to, that's like a huge project. Did it obviously, um, and it, and we in the end of the exhibition we put all of this back. We put the electrical system back. We re sheetrocked everything, and we kept the window because the window was so present and so great. And what's been interesting is that every artist that we've shown in the gallery since has made use of the window in one way or another. So this one project in a group show that was so audacious and so much about a present response to a historical artwork has now become, and the, and the cut in the window is very Mataclarkian, if that's the way you would say that. It's very rough, it's very crude. Uh, there's no finishing it off in a nice way. It's like just glass attached to window, rough, concrete. Um, but it's been an amazing legacy of the, of the show. And oddly enough, three years later, these guys are now the architects renovating the entire building. Writing. How many people find it really troubling and problematic to write about their own art? It's tough, right? You you get better at it if you read good writing. I will tell you. I will tell you that. Uh, this is a work by Luis Kamnitzer, a quite well-known uh, artist who works in a variety of ways. 
often with language. This is, somebody was talking about Harold Fletcher earlier. Uh, Harold Fletcher is an artist we did a project with uh, at the Art Center. He runs a program in Portland, Oregon at the uh, Portland State University. Um, and these are his ideas. And these ideas go for pages and pages and pages, and they're all on his website. And what's really interesting is if you, and these are just ideas that he comes up with for artworks. And it's really fascinating. I'm sorry, I'm standing right there. Um, some of these he's made, some of these he hasn't made. It's, the interesting part of this is that he makes this, these ideas available on his website. He does not seem worried that you may make these works if you see his ideas. He's also an interesting artist in that he's quite well known for a collaborative project with the filmmaker Miranda July, if that name rings a bell for you, a project called Learning to Love You More, which is a history of assignments that are provided on a website authored by them, which have been used by thousands of artists all over the world who enact the solutions to their projects and mail them in in digital form to the website. So you'll get, you know, 60 responses to take a picture of your parents kissing or take a picture underneath your bed. And so I find it interesting, Harold has been one of the artists who's really kind of championed the idea that ideas are very much public in this way and, and that, that real Art, that artists' solutions to some of these kinds of ideas, as well as non-artists' solutions, uh, are of equal interest. Reading was simply me asking a series of artists, Craig Drennan being one of them, uh, what do you read? What's, what, if, I had to, if you had to take 10 books <coughs> in the fire out of your house, which would be the 10 that you'd grab? This is the pile of work, <coughs> the pile of books that was suggested and photographed by the artist, Nikina Cacciadoria. Um, and you can see it's a pretty wide-ranging uh, list. This is Michael Rooks. He's the uh, curator of the High Museum. And so this is his list. And again, you'll see it's got some populist <coughs> novels and religious texts and famous art history texts uh, and, you know, 20th century highlights, Moby Dick, you can see so if I asked you on your way home to think about your house is burning, you have to get 10 books out of there, what would you pick? It starts to tell you about what matters to you. Like what, what not, you can't get these books again, but it's like the book either, here's what it is as an object, what it says, was it who gave it to you, whatever, wherever you want to define those answers. Uh, we were talking earlier, Owen and I, about this idea of community. What does it mean to work in a context, in a city, in a context, with friends, with people you know? Um, I, 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 in a sense, I think I published this book if only to be able to include this photograph. Because this photograph was um, part of a collaborative drawing session between David Humphrey, David Borkhart, Jennifer Coates, who's David's partner, and Sharon Mesmer, the poet, who's this David's partner, and myself. And for years, we would get together, eat Chinese food, and do drawings, and pass them, each other, pass them to each other. And this was the result of me passing David a very scatological drawing, and him totally losing his mind, <laughs> because he wasn't prepared for what the drawing was. Um, what was it? I can't tell you. Um, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> but the idea of friendships, the idea of classmates, one of the things that I would say that I've said in many schools when I've gone is that the people that are your friends at college or grad school may be the most important people that you ever meet. The value of you coming to school is pretty much to meet and absorb whatever the hell your teachers are going to offer you and whatever you can get from them by virtue of questions and engagement, but also your friendships and a couple of people you may become close to will potentially sustain you for the rest of your life. And what you do with those people. Do you organize shows with them? Do they look at your work in your studio? Uh, do you read each other's writing on the way to something that you're sending in for a grant? 
What kind of community do you want to have here? What spaces are available here? What is here? Who is here? What can you do with here? Some of that is a top-down reality. Some of that is, well, there's four galleries and they only show so-and-so, or there's only so much money, or there's five collectors, or whatever. There's that. That's the top-down model. The other model is the bottom-up model. Like, let's start a reading group. Or let's make a show in somebody's backyard. Let's, you know, that kind of thing. Sometimes the best strategy is not waiting for other people to give you stuff. Sometimes the best strategy is you deciding that you can give yourself stuff. And that is usually done best with a couple of people you like, just from my experience. Um, this is a series of photographs, just to tell you how fleeting some of this is. This is really interesting. Um, I heard about this and wanted it to be part of my book in this way. Anybody know who this is? Not Craig German? Anyone? Okay, that's the very well-known art dealer, Leo Castelli, who showed Bob Rauschenberg and Frank Stella, Jasper Johns. Anybody who knows that woman? That woman wrote a very negative review in the New York Times of that man right over there. <laughs> he seems to have lived to tell the tale. Uh, anybody know who that is? That man? Robert Maplethorpe. Anybody know who that guy is standing next to him? That's Sam Wagstaff, one of his biggest collectors. And that's the ever popular Bruce Town. All of these photographs were taken by um, I don't have my book with me, and I'm going to forget now. It's really fun. I'm not going to say it. Do you, you know? Do you remember? Remember who the photographer is? Um, a box of found photographs. There's a box of found. Well, I know that one. I'm trying to remember now. I have to remember. Who's got my book? Anybody? Jennifer. Oh. John's got it. <laughs> uh, look it up in the. Uh, we had shit, one we were passing. Jerry Ordover. That's all I need. I just needed to just look at John for a second. Okay, Gerald Ordover. Anybody know who Gerald Ordover is? There is absolutely no reason that you should. <laughs> Gerald Ordover was Leo Castelli's lawyer for years, okay, for years. He went to all these openings. He knew all of these people. He took all of these photographs. When he died, in some crazy, I don't know what, his family wound up putting all of these photographs in several boxes and bringing them to the 26th Street Flea Market in New York where Matthew Higgs, artist, writer, curator, director of White Columns in New York, found them, bought them, did a show with them, saved them. Crazy, crazy, crazy. Okay, you make stuff, you put it in the world, you hope people show up, and this now is about audience. This is a book this is the sign-in book for my old gallery in New York. And, you, and, and for people who have galleries or go to galleries, sometimes you sign your name, you go see shows, right? To let somebody know you were there, your friends, teacher. So, you know, people from Art America, and there's the, you know, problematic with Bert Smith. Here's her now, her <coughs> salts. Um, Part of the way people get to know who saw their show is that people are dutiful about signing in, you know. Um, the question of audience is an interesting one because sometimes you don't really have a clue who your audience is, right? Who's buying, you know, Beyonce albums? I mean, Beyonce probably knows pretty much the pretty is. Um, you know, there are ways of understanding demographics about who's supporting what. But, you know, like, what people are getting out of what you do, who they are, are they young, are they old, are they here, are they not here? Um, interesting question. And I think this comment by Mado Thompson, who's a curator in New York who runs something called Creative Time in New York, they do very elaborate public projects. Um, if you want to make work for yourself, and you're the audience and the, and the maker, and this is a self-involved loop, that's fine. That's again, back to the, you decide what you want to do. If you want to put it out there, uh, there's a whole bunch of people out there, 
and it's really interesting. Most of the, you know, I think that you've heard people who like would say, uh, should the artist cater to the audience? Okay, you're Martin Scorsese. You make uh, mafia movies that everybody likes. Should you make mafia movies for the rest of your life? I mean, you're pretty good at it. People like the ones you make, but what happens when you want to make a movie about the Dalai Lama? Should you make that movie? Is that going to be as popular as the movie you made about, uh, you know, Las Vegas? Probably not, but is that okay? Does that make you a more interesting artist if you bounce around, or should you be consistent? If you're uh, Stephen King, and you write pretty unbelievable horror stories, and you've been a millionaire from doing that, and they made it to movies and all kinds of other things that may be sexy and fun for you, should you give people some more of that? Or allow yourself to be taken in another direction? It gets very complicated when all of a sudden an audience likes what you do, right? Or buys what you do. Or you now get accustomed to a kind of lifestyle from doing, selling, buying, whatever, any the thing that an audience might like. Um, people respond in a variety of ways to that issue. Who is liking what they do and what does it mean? Um, this is an interesting relationship. Uh, this is really artworks meant for an audience of one, in this case me, or two, my partner. This is the artist William Pobell, an artist I've done quite a lot of projects with. These are postcards that would come in the mail every once in a while to my gallery. They would say things like, my penis is fine, how are you? Or they would have the date and the phrase, I'm still black, 11-13-2007. Uh, these were mailed to all kinds of people in the art world. People that William knew, people that he didn't know. And many of the people kept them. I kept them. Uh, many of these works are now in museum collections all over the world. I mean, not just these works, but other works by William. And so sometimes something like, I'm going to make 100 postcards with an image, with a provocative phrase, or with a photograph on the other side, and I'm going to mail them to powerful people in the art world, or to whoever you want to mail them to. That may just be enough to get somebody to kind of go, oh, this is a weird postcard thing. Or I've got this weird blog thing that's interesting to me. Or I get a box every month from somebody I don't know, but things are interesting in there. These are all strategies of reaching an audience. And sometimes they work. People know the artist Ed Ruscha, Los Angeles. Very interesting to my mind, artist. In various ways, artists are always, in a sense, working for themselves. If they happen to find an audience, that's great. And most people want an audience. I want a thousand people to come to the gallery more than twelve people. Twelve would be good, but a thousand is better. Because I don't do all the stuff I do hoping that people don't use it, enjoy it, feel transformed by it. Um, and so, not just artists, but curators and healers and teachers and other people all have a relationship with audience also. This is a work by the artist Paul Ramirez Jonas, which is a life-size horse made out of cork, which is based on a horse in a famous sculpture in, in Italy. And the piece is called The Commons. And what the piece is, is that the pedestal is also made of cork, and like a very famous sculpture that's in Rome uh, called Il Pastino, which was a, a, a deformed uh, sculpture in the year of Piazza Madonna in Italy that people for various decades pin notes to. It's almost like a kind of public uh, town hall object. Um, and so this work has been shown all over the world. And in each place it's shown People use it as a kind of repository of notes, objects, business cards. Um, in a sense, it's a work which pictures the audience that sees it. And of course, Paul is interested in ideas about memorials and, and uh, histories of representation. 
this is a work in its original form which has a rider on it. And so in Paul's version, the rider is absent. And so this idea of sense of a mirror of the participants becomes a filling rider. Um, Criticism, I'll move a little more quickly. Uh, we mentioned Anya Lithvig earlier. Anya saves every rejection letter she's ever gotten. There's thousands of them. And so this is, I think, in a way, as good a version of this as you can get. Wonderful stuff, not what we need right now. You're just trying to match the right match. Right? You and the right gallery. You and the right collector. You and the right fill in the blank. This is a poem that I came across by Aaron Bells, which I really love putting in the book. We'll see whether this applies for tomorrow's print. <laughs> How many people are currently watching David Mamet's Daughter on Girls on HBO? Anyway? It's good, right? That's the part where I show up him, just FYI. <laughs> So career, I was talking to Craig about this earlier. Let's try this as an experiment, okay? This is a picture of a guy named Charles Goldman. This was a work, how many of you are currently in grad school here? Okay. This was made while Charles was in graduate school in Chicago. The project is called Happy to Be Here. How many of you are currently happy to be here right now? Wow. Well, most people are going to raise their hand. Um, okay, so this is a piece. It's an hour-long video of Charles smiling. Okay, ready? This is where we're going to veer into Andy Kaufman territory. Ready? Everybody try to smile. Everybody smile. Smile. Ready? We all do it together, just for a minute or two. Ready? Go. It's really hard. An hour, people. Okay. An hour. You ever felt like that? We were at a party and you're trying to be like putting on a good face? An hour. It's painful. And he goes and you watch him on this video and it goes like and it starts literally like foaming at the mouth. I mean it's really hard to do. Um, and the piece, in a weird way, is about that feeling of being in public, um, that feeling of performing for others, of putting on the good face. Um, we were talking about Mira Shore earlier. Mira Shore is a, is a painter, writer. If you, if you don't know her work, writing or painting, uh, she's somebody to look up. This, uh, she's a miraculous uh, thinker in my mind and, and, a, and a friend of mine. Uh, this single phrase, which came out of a text of hers, which I think is on failure and anonymity, uh, is maybe one of the most motivational things for me in the course of trying to write this book the way I wrote it, which is an absolute reminder that this is a lifetime endeavor. You're going to go up and you're going to go down. And it's going to be an ever-changing road. This is a painting uh, that's a painting that's meant to look like an auction uh, uh, book, the auction results, an auction catalog is what they're really called. David Diaw, a painter who created a fictional painting, this painting, Mean Things, created a fictional provenance for it, provenance meaning all the places it was shown. So this painting that didn't exist show the Postmasters, his gallery in New York, the Museum of Modern Art, as part of David D. Allen, 25 years of his art, which is a retrospective that never took place. The Stedelijk Museum, great museum in Amsterdam, and the Pompidou Center, all wonderful venues, was estimated at auction, where it didn't go, to sell for this. It sold for this, in theory. So the whole thing is a fiction. The whole thing is the career that David would like to have, but doesn't have. Okay. <clears throat> Let's just read this in silence. Um, okay. This is the part.
part of this where I basically tell you that if you're involved in this thing, this art thing, for whatever reason you're involved in it, you should pretty much find something out about what this whole thing's about. If you're interested in galleries, you should find out what galleries do, how they run, maybe you want to intern at one, maybe you want to visit them, maybe you want to talk to people who run them. If you're interested in curating, you should talk to people who organize shows, you should read about curators. It's like the swimming thing. It's the, you're getting involved in a career. Some people don't like to call what we do in the arts a career, but it's a career. One of the things that great here is how I would normally use this, just FYI. I used to do this when I taught a freshman class. What do you need to know to be an artist? Okay, I'd ask freshmen this and they'd go, well, you need to have ideas, you need to express yourself. Um, Anybody else? You'd have to have some of the things we have in the book. You'd have to have some subject that you're exploring. You'd have to have some materials that you're good at. And then they'd slowly, like for freshmen, they'd sort of get maybe the six or seven things and then they'd stop, okay? And then I would say, what do you need to know in order to be a plumber? And then they would go, well, you need to know how to weld. You need to know what's code. You need to know what's code in various states. You need to be licensed, you need to know about water, you need to, and all of a sudden the list got to be like, you know, 25 things. Okay. Um, this is no less rigorous than this. And I didn't write lawyer, doctor, okay? This is a field with a history with specific things that you need to know. Same with this. You're a printmaker? Do you know anything about the history of printmaking? Probably not a bad idea. Why are you using printmaking? Who else uses printmaking? Who writes about printmaking? What magazines publish printmaking? What collections are in printmaking? Okay, there's a lot to know. <coughs> a lot of people get involved in this history or this, this discipline thinking that there's not that much to know. There's just like, oh, well, make stuff. <laughs> a little more complicated than that. We're talking about Nicole Eisenman. This is a painting which I love and put in this book. It's called From Success to Obscurity. People recognize this uh, superhero. He's not having a particularly good day. Sometimes, I'll focus here on Jean de Buffet, the French painter, sculptor. This is really interesting. Sometimes the work of an artist that you appreciate might be a way if that person appreciates what you do, that might be uh, a mark of success for you. So-and-so likes my work. This was in a book by Du Buffet talking about the painter Ivan Albright, who happens to be one of my favorites. Uh, the museums in Chicago, the Art Institute in particular, has some amazing Ivan Albrights. Um, total crazy piece of art trivia. Anybody remember or know the name of the film that Ivan Albright made the deteriorating paintings for, 1950s or so. Anybody? Dorian Gray? Yep, picture portrait of Dorian Gray. Um, so here's Jean Dubuffet writing about, saying that you know he's never encountered a painting that gave him such a strong sense of commotion as his painting of a door by Ivan Albright. Now, if you know Ivan Albright's work, and you know Jean de Buffet's work, you will say, well, that's totally logical that these guys would like, that he would like this work. But I would imagine that Ivan Albright was not displeased by this testimonial, okay? This is Karen Olivier making a life-size handball court in our gallery out of foam and concrete. Um, this was an idea that took many, many hours and many, many people to realize. Um, the success of this was just she had been wanting to make this work forever, finally made it. This is my mentor, uh, an artist I went to graduate school to study with, the political painter Leon Bell. I think this is, this is a phrase and statement which is very, very true.
anybody in any subject, topic, anything? Sure. Um, <coughs> coming. I, um, this semester, my students have said over and over again how they're hungry for this sort of discussion. So I think it's really important for them to hear. Um, and I love the like the near shore quote in particular. Um, just this idea of it being for the long run, like what it means to make art over a lifetime. And um, I, I'm just curious in, in finding a way to have a career that's sustainable. Have you seen like a best practice type of thing? Like, I, there's a great quote I love of Robert Store um, shortly after he became the head at Yale, you know, the director at Yale, um, where he talks about um, how critical it is for young artists to make sure that they're putting their energies in the right places and to know what is an opportunity worth their time and energies and what's not. And, and I think that's so true. I mean, I, I think it's important. I don't know. If, sometimes, if you it's really, that, sometimes it's really yeah. hard to know. Yeah. Um, I think one of the things that, that uh, Craig and I were talking about in the drive from Atlanta, which is that you have to try stuff. You don't know what the hell is going to be meaningful. You don't know what's going to be best. I mean, if everybody had a best practice that we could tell you all, this whole thing would be so easy. But it doesn't, your ability to exert to, it's like if I gave you a script, or if I, you know, it's like a sport, I'm not a big sports person, but it's like, here's the play. You go run down that way, and after 20 feet, turn around and I'll throw the ball to you. If I tell you to do that, you're going to do it totally differently. You're going to do it totally differently. I may not throw it where it's supposed to go. That play is scripted. There's the play. It's going to change every time. You're going to not feel good that day. You're going to be ready for your interview, but you know what? Your car broke down and you got anxious and you had to take a cab and now you showed up for the interview. The thing that, that artists need to do, the things that curators do, the things that gallerists do, Collectors, collectors don't know everything that they're going to collect. Some of them are very like, I don't know. I walked into that gallery and that thing hit me and now I want to own that. And now I want to own more things by that person. And I want to meet that person and I want to contribute money to their book that's coming out. Like, all of that stuff is not easily scriptable. It's motivated by all kinds of stuff. The only thing for my, and I will tell you that like I can sit here and talk to you about these are the things and blah, 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 blah. I didn't plan this. When I was at Cooper Union wanting to be a painter, I didn't know I was going to be a curator. I had no idea. I didn't meet any curators at art school. I didn't own it, know anything about owning a gallery until I owned one. But I was turning 30 and I was scared shitless and I decided I really need to do something and like owning a gallery seemed like the logical thing to do after working in galleries long enough to know, I think I know how to sell stuff. I think I found several artists I'd like to put my money and my energy behind. Um, as I used to say about owning a gallery, nobody had more fun losing all their money than me. <laughs> but by the same token, I met almost every damn person I ever wanted to meet in the art world. And so that was like a brilliant idea to open a gallery and lose a lot of money and go become a curator. But I actually thought that when I had a gallery functioning as a dealer, that in a sense that's where I learned about curating. Because I could try stuff because I had basically said, this is my space and I can decide whatever the hell goes on in here because it's my money that's actually paying for it. And so if you're an artist or if you're trying to write or if you're trying to do anything, that's back, back to that, like, try to know as much as you can about what you're getting involved with. Read, talk to people, intern, uh, travel. You want to know what an art fair is like? Here in Florida, figure out if seven of you can chip in and go to Miami and, like, go to the art fair. It will drive you crazy, but it will be worth going to because you'll find out a lot. If you make abstract paintings, this size and you're whatever and you're very good at it, go to New York City and run around Chelsea or the Lower East Side or Brooklyn and see what happens when you run into 79 versions of what you do. And then come home and try to figure out how you're going to make some more of that. 
<laughs> that's the script. I mean, that's really challenging. It's really challenging. I, the only thing I guess I, I always side on the side of more information is better. It's better to be not naive about what you're doing. It's not good to be crushed by the knowledge. So that's the dance, right? Like, how do you get information, try to give your, it's very hard to have any perspective on this when you're the person trying to do it. It's why talking to other people is usually very helpful. Why, when you have the chance to put your work in front of people and get opinions, you should probably do it. Why, when you get a chance to study with somebody whose work you really appreciate, if you have that chance, go do it. If you meet other people not in your discipline, this is the other thing, like one of the things I'm doing more of, which is why you see the book include chefs and novelists and filmmakers and uh, poets, is because more and more I've started to really cross over the line from the people I'm most interested in are not just artists. I mean, that's 90% of what my day-to-day -day is about, but I find I'm much more interested and I find my world sort of expands the more I talk to dancers or business people or horticulturists or just people that do interesting stuff. Right now, my criteria now is I just want you to be interesting. That's it. I don't really care what you do. I just want it to be interesting. If everything has a history, everything has a, a set of protocols, everybody, everything has a what the hell is water, you know, like everything has a set of rules. It's interesting to know those rules, and then it's interesting to not care about those rules sometimes. I mean, I think that's, that's, I mean, like the way I would answer that. It's like you have to do shows in coffee shops to cook my friend this morning. You have to do two-person shows and weird little things. You have to work hard and not be sure if it's going to work out. Because you learn stuff like by doing that. And that's the way you meet other people and expand your network and all of that. And that just leads to stuff. And every experience I had pretty much led me to here. When I could start to steer it, I tried to steer it. And that, that's pretty much it. And it's a life. And as Leon says, sometimes it's good and sometimes it's not. And sometimes you're in love and sometimes your work is horrible. And sometimes your work's great and you can't get a date. And it's all fun. Right, else? I think about a lot of our students who make work that's not particularly sellable. It's more about the experience of the moment. Um, I, 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 I'd like you to talk to them about your recommendations there, but also I suspect that the, uh, your attitude has changed considerably from going from being a, a gallery owner to someone who's a curator of foreign arts. Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, I'm. I'm going to be the first person to say I've learned so much stuff working as a commercial dealer. Talking to critics, talking to collectors, talking to artists, I mean, just figuring that, talking to other dealers. Um, the thing that I believe is that anything is sellable. And that's been proven. Anybody know the art of Richard Tuttle? Anybody know the art of Fred Sandback? Joseph Boyce? Any of these names ring a bell? Okay, if you can sell a little piece of sausage in a vitrine on a metal stand, <laughs> You can sell it. Anything sellable. We were talking earlier about Julian Schnabel. People know Julian Schnabel's art, not his films, but the art that precedes his films. So Julian Schnabel came to New York from Texas and made gigantic, heavy, unbelievably big, broken, figurative art with plates and with automobile glue. And they needed 40 people to move them. And only like two galleries in the city could show them because they were so big, which translated to only 72 people in the world could buy these things. And that was Julian's roll of the dice. I'm not going to make little things. I'm going to make something. It's going to be like I'm putting all my eggs in the basket of this work is going to be so audacious, so intense, so problematic, but memorable. You're going to either love it or you're going to hate it. And eventually enough people came to like it and buy it and deal with all the crap that comes along with wanting to own this. The plates fall off. Assistants have to come and fix them. 
I mean, like a nightmare. Nightmare. Sometimes you do the unbelievably inconvenient, outrageous thing, which gets you attention of a sort that you want, and you decide, I don't care about all of that. I just want that. And I'm going to put a lot of energy into that. Sometimes it's like, I don't care about selling things. I don't care. I show art that's from collections. I show art that's sellable. I show a lot of art that's very hard to sell, made by artists who in some cases don't care about selling. I've shown a lot of political art in my life. Those artists are not all that interested in selling their work. They're artists who are interested in reaching people. Um, some of the best, Leon, some Leon y'all would tell you, I mean, he was very lucky at the end of his life, but Leon would say, be the first person to say, like, uh, there are way more people that don't own what I do than who do, and they probably will never buy this work. It's very problematic. And, and he would complain, like to me and others, like I don't understand why Cy Twombly sells paintings all over now. He's like, because Cy Twombly didn't make a painting of a guy getting his head blown off in the back of a car. <laughs> what are you interested in? And he'd go, I know, but you know, I, you know, and his ego would kick in, and he'd go. I mean, one of the funniest stories was Leon getting a, a retrospective at the Brooklyn Museum. He was pissed. He thought it should be at the Whitney or MoMA. He got a front page New York Times review, glowing, totally like glowing, career defining, 78 years old, I don't remember how old he was, and he was like, I was glocked. And what that means was the article was written by Grace Glock, the least influential critic of the world. <laughs> and he was pissed. It was like, why don't I have the great review from the from Michael Kimmelman. Why don't I have the great review by Roberta Smith? Why isn't this at MoMA? Why isn't MoMA buying the, the mercenary painting? What, I mean, 80 one-man shows, 80 solo museum shows all over the world. Books as tall as me, catalogs all over the world. Sales, not so much. But he makes work that's like really troubling and hard to buy. <laughs> like. You gotta figure out as best as you can like what you care about. If you care about selling stuff, then that's what you care about. And you may be wrong in your strategy of how you're approaching that, but what's interesting is to try to get people who might have resources to care about what you do and see if what you do is interesting to them and try to find those right people that match up. And it takes a long time and not everybody matches up easily. In certain areas, in Atlanta, even a big city like Atlanta is not easily matchable. There's not 400 collectors who are out there buying challenging things. There's a handful. And those are the same people I need to support my art center. And some of the stuff I show isn't the stuff that they like. And I have to try to convince them, you don't have to like it. You have to help support it so that she can go see it. You know, like so with sales, we're all selling stuff. I would have to say that I'm, I've always been really intrigued how the whole art world works. You know, the times I call it, there's this thing that I try not to think about that when I practice. Like, I can't think about that when I make work, but I want to be knowledgeable of how it all goes. So, what I'm asking is, can there be a balance between the management and the talent? But do you still paint? Do I still paint? Uh, boy, that was not where I thought that question was. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I don't still paint. Um, I say often that there's like nine, maybe more, simultaneous art worlds. They all are operating, they all overlap. What happens at auctions, pretty much, like doesn't really affect me very much. If so-and-so just set a price for, you know, Damien Hirst sells his, you know, a dot painting for $500,000, that really doesn't do much in my day to day. Uh, Little galleries that are opening up in parts of Queens that are weird and interesting, that has more to do with like what I'm interested in than 57th Street galleries, because that's pretty much not what I'm showing. And I was saying, and I, and I think in a weird way, uh, my evolution from being an artist to making, I mean, it was a figurative art painter, printmaker, who went to study with well-known figurative painters, and, and at graduate school, my own kind of mind opened up different ways of working. My ideas stopped 
being things I thought could be paintings, and I started to make installations and photographs and do performances. And then I started to write, and then I started to read a lot of writing. And over the evolution of my time, I felt I was more able to be myself and to do something that seemed natural to me by not making art, but by organizing and being involved with other things. And that just became true for me. And that's, and I just felt that that's been the right road ever since. Um, I do collages, I do drawings, I do stuff that's based for my own joy. Um, I don't think I have any desire to show them. Uh, I might be interested in making books that would present them in one way or another, but basically, it's just to keep myself in the I think we're probably at the like yeah, end because we're at that like we're long over. But if you're one more 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 more? I'll be here all night. Could you talk about the uh, locality, maybe tiny towns, medium towns, <coughs> urban centers, and strategies you've seen? Yeah. Uh, questions about you know localities <coughs> and towns. I mean the Byron Kim, uh, no, not Byron Kim, the Jubain quote, <coughs> which maybe it was up there for soon the time. You inherit the problems of wherever you happen to be. If you're in New York, it's great. That's also like there's 10,000 of you, and everybody, you know, it's expensive and it's problematic and whatever. Um, if, I mean, I, I would sort of say the issue around like where you are and what resources are there, it's, it's trying to just maximize. I mean, I think this is true. What do you have? What what are the what are the tools of where you are? Um, one of the key things that's really challenging is how to avoid being depressed. How to avoid getting uh, down on what isn't available to you. That's the real kicker. I mean, how to how to like stay optimistic about it. That's where when I hear and this happens in, in Atlanta, we talk a lot about this in Atlanta. Uh, that that even in Atlanta, I'm always surprised. When I ask artists, you know, uh, so who do you talk to? Like, who's in your studio? And they go, oh, no, 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 not that many people come to my studio. And I go, really? That's insane. I don't know any artists who don't have a dialogue with a couple of people. You don't need, like, a horde of them. You just need a couple. Um, if there are resources, Often resources go, uh, everybody's always like in that grass is greener, I've got to go to the bigger city, I've got to go to, uh, whatever it is where you are is insufficient. Everybody feels that. Okay, I need more collectors, he needs more collectors, I need more patrons, I need a bigger space, I need the lighting, everybody's got something they're bitching about. The challenge is like how do you use or maximize what you have on the way to try to get it to what else you might like to have. Um, there is a lot that can be done with a couple of people with some energy, you know? There's usually spaces to do stuff in. Do stuff. There's usually, you're at a school. I mean, I often talk to artists who teach. I mean, this is, this, there's a lot of people in the room who teach. You have a university. Do they have a laser cutter that you can use? Do they have a welding shop that you can use? If you don't teach here and you're out and you aren't available to the things that are on campus, a big printer, whatever, if you have to go buy a laser cutter or rent a big printer or find some tech person to help you do the video editing that you need to do, all of that gets exponentially harder. So what are you, what, like, what do you have at your disposal what weird person just started a letterpress company downtown? What person is, what new restaurant that has some big walls that you just went to or read about in the local paper like that might be interested in your big painting? Because like your big painting may allow you to trade them for a bar tab or a or a, uh, you know, company, um, you know, I mean, I know, I know some young artists who, who, like, traded work for, I know artists who traded work for legal fees, for dental work, for uh, uh, food tabs, for travel, I mean, there's trading, there's selling, there's, I mean, like, all of this stuff is available to you, but it, it, it like, becomes a challenge to just try to figure out, and I'm saying this, like, the great oracle of, you know, it's just a little bit. 
I, I find it challenging to take my own advice sometimes as well. You know, I don't do as much of the stuff that even I know I should do. And but I but I'm like trying to get better at it, and I'm I'm not bad at it. But it's it's a challenge. It really is. I mean, so the question is like. Each place has an issue, and the question is, what can you do about where you are? Either complain about where you are or move, because there really is no alternative. I mean, either do something with it or find another place to move to to complain about when you get there. <laughs> <laughs> On that happy note, thank you very much. <laughs>